Glad you remembered that. I would have forgotten it, so I'm glad you did this. Oh. I think you could admit all over there. And George, if you see anything, you need to do what I need to do. Okay, good go. Feel free. I'm sorry for your living hours. No worries. That's great. Well, welcome everyone. We're so thrilled to see all the people that are here. We uh, have come from kind of a wide range of places, and that's just exactly what we had hoped for. Uh, some of you remember that um, Kevin's uh, schedule was rescheduled to uh, this particular time, and last time we had uh, Professor Katie Kay as our speaker, and her two daughters wanted to come. It's not that she twisted, <laughs> twisted their arms. So we're so delighted to have Kevin O'Brien back. Some of us uh, have been so excited about his forum presentations. He's a marvelous presenter and always, um, always keeps us um, thinking and, and learning, and that's wonderful. Um, he's a professor of religion and um, religion at PLU. He's a good Lutheran. He's also been the chair of the Environmental Studies, and he's been Dean of Humanities. His courses at PLU and his teaching in the community, which he does a lot of, by the way, I found out, are top, on topics of Christian ethics, environmental ethics, and social justice. He was born, raised, and educated in Atlanta. He received his PhD from Liberty University. But the last 18 years have made him a committed Northwesterner and a devoted root. He has written extensively on religious responses to environmental degradation. His books include An Introduction to Christian Environmentalism, Environmental Ethics and Uncertainty, and he, uh, what he will be discussing today is his book, the violence of climate change. Lessons of resistance from nonviolent actors, which I found a very different, um, different uh, lens to look at. How are we uh, to protest the degradation and the continuation of policies that are making things worse way too rapidly? How are we to do that? Uh, and his answer is, there are nonviolent ways. And he uses examples from uh, which he'll talk about. Um, his latest book connects the theology of the powers and principalities with contemporary climate justice. I want to mention again about the sheet that's going around. At the end of um, April, the 30th, uh, Kevin O'Brien, our speaker tonight will be uh, on deck again at PLU, and this is an offering for PLU alums, but not just alums. So he said that if I send uh, the email to you, you can register. And it's a Zoom meeting on the 30th of April, it's a Tuesday at four o'clock. So the sheet that's going around is for you to sign your email address and then I will know who to send this information to. 
and it could also be sent, you could send it to other people who may possibly be interested. So I don't want to take any more time because I want Kevin to be able to give us his full scope of information. So welcome Kevin back. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here and um, uh, especially a pleasure to be um, in this space. I was reflecting as I was driving over that I'm pretty sure I first uh, did an adult education forum here at Agnes Day in 2007. And, um, and I've been back as often as you all have me since. And it is always a pleasure. And uh, particularly a pleasure to have um, uh, folks from Agnes Day and from other, other congregations and other communities here. Uh, really look forward to, to talking with you and do hope we'll have some time and we'll take some time for conversation. Um, we have a few kinds of tech going, so I'll ask just um, if you have trouble hearing me or if anything is going wrong on that screen, feel free to let me know. Um, and hopefully this screen will have my slides and I will we will manage it all. But if, if uh, we run into any trouble, of course, uh, shout it out. Or if I say something um, particularly striking, feel free to shoot your hand up and say, oh my gosh, is this true? And um, we'll try and figure it out together. Um, but thank you again uh, for being here, and thanks so much to, um, to, to George and to Marilyn and Bellis um, for planning, and to Katie for um, welcoming me here, and also for being here when I couldn't in January. Um, the, uh, the broad topic of the violence of climate change is, um, is something that uh, I am passionate about, and I, and I like to talk to communities about, because I find, uh, and I find this with my students, and I find this with my friends, and I find this with my parents, um, that climate change is an issue that often feels overwhelming, and, uh, and feels overwhelming in how complicated it is, overwhelming in how, uh, uh, how dire it sometimes feels, how, how the gloom and doom, and overwhelming just in the technical aspect of it. And so what, what I will try to offer is one perspective, on how we might make sense of climate change, not the whole complexity of it, but, uh, but what we might say, uh, one perspective, not only on what it is, but about how we can think about it and how we can think about response. So uh, the organizing question, I think I gotta go over here to do this. Um, sorry, let me find my notes. The, uh, the animating question, uh, that I'm motivated by as I come here is how should Christians who are concerned about climate change um, respond to it? What should we do? And this um, uh, this is for me, and I think for pretty much anybody who uh, talks to folks about climate change, um, look at Kate, she can confirm. This is the most often question, right? Uh, that we get whatever whatever presentation I give when I talk about climate change. Almost always, the first question is, okay, so what do I do? With um, and whatever I teach about climate change, uh, whatever assignment, what students give back to me is a paper that says, okay, great, now tell me what you do about this. Um, and so that's a really important question. And I want to tell you now what I also tell my students, which is it's a really important question, which doesn't mean that there is an easy answer or that we have quick answers. And so part of what I want to do is to back up from that question. And before uh, talking about how I think Christians who are concerned about the issue should respond, to ask what, what kind of problem is climate change? How do we think about uh, what, uh, what we are thinking about when we talk about climate change? How do we talk about the kind of conversations we want to have? Um, and uh, since you all are sitting at tables, and since I um, teach for a living, I can't resist doing uh, uh, what you know I'm about to do. Uh, and, and those of you on Zoom, if there's anyone near you, please turn to your neighbor and speak. Uh, but I just want you to take about a minute and just bring to quickly at the table. There will be a temptation uh, for someone at your table to give a lecture. <laughs> um, maybe more than one of you. And that's fine. We know that temptation is there. But what I want to encourage you to do is just run around the circle and each say like a word. When I say, what kind of problem is climate change? What word occurs to you? And just share that and try and limit it to about one word. And then if I haven't called you back, somebody can start lecturing about their word. 
But yeah. let's start with um, start with the first word that comes to mind, and then I'll just I'll just be curious to hear what you come up with. So let's take about a minute on that, please. Okay. which we not gotten all the way around the table. Did we do it? Okay. We're close. Close it out. Uh, now, now I will indulge those of you who really wanted your voice heard because I will invite you to share your word or someone else's word. But well, what came up? Uh, what kind of problem could we think of climate change as being? What would you say? I think that extremes. Extremes. A problem of extremes. Yeah. Extremes. Yeah. That, that the more the cold, the more the hot. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so. You only get me one the word. Two. That's the point of It's a great I, word. I love it. Remember, I'm very. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't. We'll come back to it. Thank you. Yes, please. Did I hear water, air, oh. air, chaos, um, horror, um, water, air, chaos, horror, me. Ooh, yeah. Hypocrisy. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, this is a powerful list, right? And I, what I find so powerful about that, it, it gets back to our extremes, right? It's a problem of, um, sorry, I think the camera might find me over here. Um, it, it's a problem of um, that feels really personal, right? So I love that somebody said me. And it's also a problem that feels really elemental, right? It's about fire and water. Um, and, and so we're, we're at these extremes of human experience, of the scale of humanity, the scale of the earth. Yeah, great. Anything else from any other tables we want to put on, put out there? Destruction. Destruction. Yeah, absolutely. It's a problem. It's a destruction. It's a, it's a problem, right? Things we are losing something. Uh, it feels like all too quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Greed. Greed. It's a problem. Greed. Yeah. Okay. So, and now we transition into a problem of what is happening, but also a question of where does this problem come from. Right? What are the roots of this problem? Um, this is a this is, I think, a really important question and an easy question to miss when we think about only parts per million or fear for the future. But what's what's the past that's led us here? Oh, what a great list! Awesome. So I'm gonna give you some other answers, but uh, one of the reasons I asked you to do that is it's really important for me to say. Time change is a complex problem. Um, if you're if you're interested in the book that you've heard about, um, the word I use there is it's a wicked problem, which is a technical term which we can talk about. But, um, but what that means is there's never going to be one answer to this question. There's never going to be one perspective. Um, and uh, uh, Mike Hulme, who's a geographer that I really respect, who writes about climate change, says we we should actually feel great freedom in this fact that no one will ever have their whole mind around climate change that no one will fully grasp it. And what that means is we don't need the right answer on what climate change is, what kind of problem it is. We need helpful answers. Um, and, and again, that hopefully feels a little freeing. So um, when I think about this question of what kind of problem we're talking about, um, the first way I want to think about climate change is that it's a, um, it's a real problem. And uh, I don't think 
I need to push this too hard in this room, uh, partly because I think Katie laid the groundwork really well, um, or or Katie built the foundation, and I just get to dance on it. Um, but uh, but of course, there are still folks around who question it, and sadly, we've spent decades as a society, as a culture, talking about whether climate change is really happening, it, and it is. Um, and and these this is the famous hockey stick graph, or one version of it, that um, tracks the drastic increase in the average temperature on the planet um, that matches the drastic increase in the parts per million of carbon dioxide and also methane and two other gases in the atmosphere. And uh, one of the things that I didn't know about this graph until um, after I'd been thinking about climate change for a long time was, um, was why baseline is so high. And you know we talk about like we're we're above this average, but the average is so much higher than most of the, the, the last thousand years. And the reason for that is um, when baseline was first determined, people didn't know about climate change, but it was already the 20th century. And so they said, okay, well let's start measuring average temperature, and we'll figure out what average temperature is. And it turns out that was already 100 years past the Industrial Revolution, so we had already raised the global average. Temperature. Uh, so, so this this graph was drawn with the assumption that baseline was uh, was wrong, with the wrong assumption about baseline. Well, what, what, how did they determine baseline? I mean, they did uh, on a certain date. Yeah. Uh, oh, not a certain date, but but uh, but looking at ice cores, looking at uh, historic records, looking at archaeological records, and um, and comparing lots and lots of data. Well, um, if you're right looking now. at the past, why is it all below the baseline? Because we didn't set the baseline until the 20th century, and the climate had already started changing. I still don't get how they set the baseline. Uh, by taking the average, average of all these measurements. The average of all those measurements. Yeah. Uh, well, when they set, the, oh, sorry, when they set the baseline, they had the wrong measurements. They were taking the average of a, a much smaller data set. That was a biased data set. Sorry. I, I, that right side of the graph that's elevated that's exactly right where the data still be. Mm -hmm. um, and so again we're back to the complexity of climate change it's a it's a messy problem uh, it's a complicated problem even the first people who were trying to track the problem didn't have enough data to fully uh to fully grasp to fully graph the problem but it's happening yes what's the gray stuff <laughs> Oh, uh, it's the um, it's the it's the range of all the all the data. Since we don't have great uh, concrete measurements of temperature from the year one thousand, instead we have lots of partial measurements and as good as we can do. So the gray is the range of all the the data we get and how where the average temperature might have been that year. And the, the, the dot is where we think it makes most sense to put it. But again, this is someone trying to figure out, I think this is miraculous, someone did this. This is someone trying to figure out what was the average temperature a thousand years ago. Um, and comparing trapped bubbles of air with tree cores and all sorts of other things. So there's a lot of gray because we're not absolutely sure. And you can see the gray shrinks when we get closer to temporary technology. But the average is pretty clear, and it goes way up. So the gray is plus or minus five percent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so climate change is real. We can measure it, um, and measuring is really hard, which is why it's great that we have um, armies of people, scientists doing that. Um, but it's really important for most of us who are not scientists to know that we also have direct access. We have experience of climate change. Because climate change is a present problem. Uh, last month, March 2024, was the hottest March ever recorded on the planet Earth. And it was the 10th month, 10th month in a row that was the hottest ever recorded. So the last 10 months have been the hottest of those months we've ever seen. Um, and there's a lot of things going on this year uh, that are just climate change. Um, and so we don't think every month is going to be the hottest ever from now on for the rest of our lives. But we do think the Earth is warm. We do know the Earth is warm. And uh, it's not just present, but it's local. Um, we have experience 
uh, extreme weather events that would have been much less common, that would have been much less likely in a world without climate change. So I just pulled a quick graph from the news about the heat wave that we experienced in 2021. And this is a picture of the Bull Creek Fire, uh, not too far from here, in 2022. The Bull Creek Fire in 2022, remember we had that, um, that weirdly long summer where it just wouldn't rain. And then um, towards the end of that summer, in October, in September and October, the air was just disgusting uh, because the Bull Creek Fire was burning. And um, the Wolf Creek Fire was tough because it was on a, on a, a hill, so it would have been really dangerous for firefighters to fight it. Um, and it's also the kind of fire at the end of a fire season that our firefighters are trained to not fight because the rains are coming, so you let it burn. Um, and the trouble with the Wolf Creek Fire is the rains didn't come for a fully five weeks after the rain was start coming. That's... Um, the sort of thing that happens more because the climate is changing, because the uh, extreme weather becomes more common, uh, droughts extend, trees are drier, uh, fires and larger fires are more. So we we have experienced climate change. Um, we have, uh, I have still in my lungs, some molecules of ash from trees that burned in the fire because of the climate, because of climate change, because of the industrial burning that's been going on so climate change is happening here, it's happening to us. Uh, it's not just happening to us, though, and it's causing a lot more trouble for some others. Uh, this is a picture of the hurricane that hit Acapulco just this October. Um, and uh, that hurricane uh, was the fastest progression from tropical storm to serious hurricane that had ever been tracked. And so uh, people had much less time than uh, you, we usually do to prepare for this hurricane, and so the damage was worse. Um, and this is devastating to the people of Acapulco who are still trying to pick up pieces and rebuild. So climate change is real, climate change is present, climate change is local, and climate change hurts human beings. Uh, Climate change is also a problem of justice. Uh, and this, uh, this increasingly has been the focus of the climate movement, which, has, um, which is still urging people to take science seriously, but it's also urging people to take the experience of frontline communities seriously, take the experience of marginalized people, uh, of indigenous people, of women, of people of color seriously, because climate change is uh, changing things and uh, those change is hardest for people to adapt who have the fewest resources, who have been deprived the most of resources and flexibility uh, by, uh, by social systems. So climate change is a problem of justice. Uh, uh, climate change is a problem of justice and a problem of justice in a time when we are associating justice with identity. So for about uh, three years until fairly recently, the loudest voices in the climate movement were the youth climate activists. And these are five young people, uh, five people who were in their teens and 20s, who went on a hunger strike uh, to protest climate change on behalf of their generation. So they're in wheelchairs because they were too weak to stand because they've been on hunger strike. Um, they went on hunger strike on the National Mall uh, when the, um, what was at that point called the Green New Deal was being debated. And, uh, and said, we, 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 don't, we don't want to take nourishment until the government takes action, uh, because we don't, we don't have hope for the world unless there's meaningful action. Um, so that was justice on, the, on behalf of young people. Um, this is uh, um, a speaker from the Puyallup tribe, again, a, a local example, um, speaking about uh, the ways climate change and the fossil fuel industry and industrialization has impacted their life and uh, their ability to stick with their uh, principles of their indigenous community and to relate to the land of the Puget Sound um, and this place as their ancestors taught them to. And so climate change is a problem of justice, of generational injustice, and of colonial is what the job is offering. So climate change is real. Uh, it's present, it's local, 
it's human, and it's a problem of justice. Again, my focus here is not that one of these is right, is the right answer, but that all of these are helpful ways to think about the problem. Climate change is also a political issue. Um, so this is a this is a photo uh, taken um, shortly before the hunger strikers with the same movement, the Sunrise Movement, and of course Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Um, they are sitting outside Nancy Pelosi's office when Nancy Pelosi was the Speaker of the House, um, yeah. and they showed up um, and legally occupied her office. Every one of them had in their hand uh, an envelope, and on the outside of the envelope was printed, "What's your plan?" And on the inside of the envelope, the young people who were protesting had written out their fears about the future, their fears about climate change. Um, and that was a precursor to their advocacy for the Green New Deal, which of course did not pass in that form, but many provisions of which became the Inflation Reduction Act, which did pass. Um, this then is the, um, the photo from the most recent big political event in climate history, which is the, the COP28, the conference of the parties that the UN gathers every year to talk about climate change. This year it was in Dubai. And the big controversy this year was that um, the climate change conference was being hosted by uh, uh, an oil country and run by the president of another company, president of uh, the UAE's oil company. And um, I mean, people tell different stories, but I would say it's really clear to me from looking at the results that there were certain conversations that couldn't be had or couldn't be concluded precisely because there was an insistence that whatever we do has to be palatable to the oil industry. So that's politics, right? Um, and there's been some progress on the national level. Uh, there's been some, I'd say, regress on the international level. Um, and and uh, next year's COP will also be hosted in a country that makes a lot of money from petroleum. And so we'll see if different outcomes can happen. But, uh, but the politics really matters. And this is something that I, that I really like to emphasize to my students, to everybody I talk to, because it is always tempting to think about climate change and think, well, if we could just stop making it political, if we could just all agree, then, um, then we can get something done on this issue. And it, it is true. If we could all agree, it would be wonderful. But the only way I know of to get us closer to agreement is to have political conversations and political debates. Um, and so that makes climate change inherently a political issue. And then finally, uh, we're getting to, to my point here. Um, climate change is a religious problem. Climate change is a religious issue. And um, I, uh, I like to take credit for parallel thinking because I was working on this book, The Violence of Climate Change, um, for a few years before I, before I published it in 2017. And so I had already had some of my answers by 2015 when Pope Francis wrote Laudato Si, which is probably the most famous text written about religion and climate change. And um, part of what Pope Francis wanted to argue is that um, you cannot say that you uh, love God and love the God who declared the earth to be good, as your beautiful poster says right there, and not care about the climate. And you cannot say that you love God's people and you want to care for your neighbor unless you are also caring about the problems that are changing the climate that are making the world less welcoming to our neighbors. So Pope Francis wrote that, and I thought, yeah, me too. I'm glad he's on board, right? Um, I'm glad he's listening. He didn't listen. <laughs> um, but he also wrote in La Dante of Sea uh, a piece that is the linchpin of the perspective I think is most useful about climate change, which is that climate change is a religious problem, and it's also a problem of violence. Um, and this is a quote from that encyclical that he wrote uh, in 2015. The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is also reflected in the symptoms of the sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. So I'll say a little more about violence, but first I just want to um, sort of reflect for a minute and ask you to reflect for a minute on what Pope Francis is saying here, uh, which is that there is something, um, there is something divisive 
there is something uh, hurtful in the human heart because we are wounded by sin, right? We call this the fall. Uh, we can call this sin. We can call this original sin. But that the effects of that are not just on people. They are also to the soil and the water and the air. And so uh, the violence, the sin of human beings is having an effect on the entire planet. So climate change is a religious problem. Climate change is a sin problem. And climate change is a violence problem. And it's that climate change is a violence problem that gets me to what eventually I'm going to argue is a hopeful conclusion. But follow me. We'll get to hope, I promise. Maybe it hasn't been hopeful yet. Sorry about that. We'll get there. Um, this is the argument of violence and climate change. You already heard about that. Um, I don't even sell the book anymore. So uh, the examples I want to give of how we can think about climate change as a problem of violence is if we think about violence as um, people through action or inaction hurting others, then we can find a lot of people who are hurt by the changing climate. These are photos from Bangladesh. And Bangladesh has what turns out to be the unfortunate distinction of being one of the lowest lying countries on the planet, which means that as the earth warms, as ice melts, as oceans expand, Bangladesh is disappearing. Bangladesh is losing coastline. And you can see here uh, eroding coastline as, uh, as waters rise. And you can see here increasingly prevalent floods in Bangladesh as not only do waters rise, but uh, monsoon through oranges uh, tends to be as the climate changes, that wet places are getting wetter and dry places are getting drier. And again, we see this here. Our summers are drier and longer than they used to be, and our winters have more torrential rain than they used to be. We get more rain all at once. That is a much bigger problem in Bangladesh than it is uh, in Gig Harbor, partly because Bangladesh doesn't have the kind of infrastructure that Gig Harbor does to move water around, but also because Bangladesh was already getting a lot of water, a lot of rain. And so flooding is a problem. These are natural disasters. Floods, uh, sea level rise, but they are natural disasters caused by human action and inaction. Right? It is the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, it is the, the industrial production of meat and other farm goods that cause CO2 to build up in the air, that cause monsoons to grow more severe in language. So human action is hurting human beings. And that's part of what I mean when I say climate change is a problem of violence. And it's not just in Bangladesh, and it's not just in other countries. Uh, these are photos of uh, uh, a town called Kivalina in Alaska. And uh, Kivalina in Alaska is also being threatened by rising seas because Kivalina is at the far north. Um, Kivalina was formerly sheltered by ice shelves, basically. And as those melt, um, water is encroaching and water is slowly eating away at Kivalina. An important fact about Kivalina is that it is uh, uh, probably almost entirely a uh, native community. And Kivalina is there as a settled community because the Bureau of Indian Affairs told the people that they had to settle there uh, about 80 years ago. They were uh, nomadic folks. They were a nomadic tribe. Um, but the Bureau of Indian Affairs said, that's not going to work for us. Uh, you need to have permanent addresses, so we're going to build you this town right here. So uh, the U.S. government settled Kivalina there. And uh, as far back as 1993, the people of Kivalina saw the waters rising and said, we will not be able to live here. This is not working. And in 1993, they started asking the U.S. government, you need to relocate us. You put us here. This isn't working anymore. You need to move on. And like I said, I promise the hope is coming later. But for the last 30 years, the US government's answer to that request has been no, ask us again next year. The people of Kivalina, seeing that wasn't working, um, uh, managed a lawsuit against the four biggest um, privately owned uh, oil companies in the world and said, the predominant reason we can't live here anymore is because of you digging this up, selling it, encouraging people to burn it. 
And um, uh, a judge threw that out and said, sorry, only the government has the standing to sue oil companies. And so the people with Kiwi and said, the government, we, we asked you to sue the oil companies on behalf of the government said, ask the standing issue. So people are still living in Kivalina, and the waters are still rising there. And again, this is a natural disaster, but it is also human violence, because it is humans that force the people of Kivalina to settle, and it is human beings and human institutions that are not giving them the resources they need to move uh, further inland, to move somewhere uh, where they could have a permanent sustainable. Then my last example, the last place I want to take you in the world is the Sudan. Um, and as I said, wet places tend to get wetter and dry places tend to get drier, and the Sudan is drier. Um, and uh, the Sudan has had uh, a series of conflicts which at times have been labeled officially a civil war over the last, over recent decades. And uh, one of the primary causes of those conflicts of that war has been the scarcity of water. That people are fighting over water, which they absolutely need to live, and of which there's less to go around. Um, and so that leads to desertification, that leads to people struggling to find enough water to live. It also leads to huge refugee populations. So there's enormous migration going on. And this, in fact, is a refugee camp in Kenya. Um, and so this is, again, a natural disaster of drought. But a natural disaster that is made much more like the exacerbated by climate change, by human choices, by the decisions that people make, and more importantly, governments and corporations make. So, uh, as I mentioned, also this is the place where we can talk about the direct um, violent result of climate change: that um, there are wars being fought over increasingly scarce water. I fear there will be wars fought over increasingly scarce land. And um, I don't, uh, I don't say violent, climate, is, climate change is violence lightly. I think I want to take really seriously the violence going on in the world. And I think about um, bombs being dropped today, sadly, lightly, this very moment in Israel and Palestine, and bombs being dropped right like this very moment in Ukraine. And um, and yet, I think part of uh, really dealing with the gravity of what's going on in those violent conflicts is to recognize. That that violence is becoming more likely the more climate changes. And so uh, the violence of the world, the sin, as Pope Francis called it, uh, becomes more perilous, becomes more extreme as the climate changes. And then we're back to that word extreme. So we've got all these examples of ways to think about climate change and people to think about when you think about climate change. We've got the scientific data, we've got the, the hurricane in Acapulco. We've got political protests in the US, we've got Pope Francis relating it to sin, we've got war in Darfur, and then we've got, uh, this, this picture is from uh, South Asia, um, we've got this sort of uh, dry riverbed. Um, and, uh, and I wanna argue that if we think of all these as connected, as expressions of violence, then we get a little more purchase on the question I started with, which is okay, so what should we do about all this? Um, and the last definition I'm going to give you is to say I think it's really helpful, and again, I think it's freeing if we think of climate change not only as a problem of violence, but a problem of structural violence. And what I mean by that is to make a distinction. When we think of violence, we often think of the, the direct harming of one person by another. Um, I Google image search punch, and this is what I came up with, and they found this. And that's direct violence, right? And that's that's violence, and that's familiar. Structural violence is when a system is constructed that hurts people and benefits other people, but nobody has to perform the violence directly, right? So when the United States was under Jim Crow, and you had strict laws that separated races, Somebody can put up a sign that said help wanted white only and say, well, that's just the law, that's just what I'm doing. And this man couldn't apply for a job, but nobody had to look him in the eye and say, I refuse to give you a job. That was a structure that was violent. And I think that's the best way we can understand climate change. Um, so racism is structural violence. Uh, patriarchy, uh, oppression of women is structural violence. Poverty, 
poverty to the degree that children are starving in this world is structural violence. These are systems that are created uh, that hurt people and benefit some others. And characteristics of structural violence are that we are all wrapped up in it. And I think over the last uh, five years or so, we've gotten a little better at thinking about with a problem like racism, that um, we all are part of a system that is racist and we can work really hard in our personal lives not to be racist, but that doesn't free us from structures that favor people of African descent and people who pass as white and disfavor uh, people of color. And that's that, uh, the nature of structural violence, that everybody's involved, but people get treated differently by the system. Those who perpetrate and benefit from violence are often unaware. This is another characteristic of structural violence, that often the last people to realize it's going on are the people who benefit. I remember vividly and with some shame uh, being in my late teens, the first time I walked by an unhoused person, I walked by a person who was cold outside in the winter and hungry and realized that there are many people in the world who go to bed every night, or who don't go to bed every night, who sleep every night out in the open because they do not have an alternative and go to bed hungry. And I had never had either experience. And that's because I grew up in a system that kept me from needing to be aware. The last characteristic of structural violence is that multiple forms of violence intersect, right? Uh, poverty and racism and uh, patriarchy come together. And colonialism intersects with those. And so different kinds of violence get mixed together. And I think what's important about saying that is that then we are able to say that climate change, too, is a form of structural violence that mixes with all these other. Okay, so I've got all my terminology out of the way. Thank goodness. What do we do with all of this? I think the first thing we do is we recognize that because these forms of violence intersect, climate change is not the first time we've ever had to, as a nation, as a species, as a Christian body of Christ, struggle against structural violence. So up here I've got some examples. I've got a picture, a uh, drawing that represents slavery. Um, slavery, which is at the foundation of this nation. I've got a drawing that represents immigrants in the 19th century who were largely discriminated against and mistreated when they got to this country. Uh, I've got a picture from the Great Depression, uh, sort of the most singular event of um, radical, dramatic poverty in our country's history. I got a picture of uh, protests against Jim Crow uh, segregation and a picture of farm workers being exposed to pesticides, which you can't make out in great detail. These are all examples of structural violence that have happened in U.S. history. And it's really controversial these days in some parts of the country to teach about bad things that happened in U.S. history and bad things the U.S. government has done. And, um, and you, already, you already know that I'm not going to show up with politics, so I'm happy to take a stand on this. You're welcome. But uh, one of the things that I, um, that I think is really important to say is if we don't recognize how disastrous slavery and racism and poverty have been in our nation's history, then we don't recognize the heroism, the how impressed we should be with the people who stood up and demanded that it change. And so I think it's really important that we recognize, yes, slavery was an abomination, so that we see that abolitionists who insisted this country will not continue with slavery legal were deeply heroic, and we should be incredibly proud of the changes they made. And so this gets to the five people that I've been most interested in who worked on those five issues. This is John Woolman, a Quaker abolitionist, uh, who refused to wear dyed clothes. He was a tailor, but he could find no clothes dye that wasn't produced by slaves. So he wore stark white clothes everywhere he went. And when people would say, why are you wearing such weird clothes? He would say, because I don't believe in slavery, because I believe God created all people to be free. This is Jane Adams, uh, found a Hull House in Chicago, in an immigrant neighborhood in Chicago, and used what she learned there to advise presidents and to help found the League of Nations, and said um, as, the, um, as the First World War was starting, that the Germans and Russians in her neighborhood could get along, and if they could get along, then surely the Germans and Russians in Europe could get along, and tried to spread that message across the world. 
Uh, this is Dorothy Day, uh, the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, uh, who, when she saw the Great Depression, said every Catholic church should open its doors wide and become houses of hospitality to house people without a place to live. And when churches refused to do that, she started just renting apartments and throwing open the doors to whoever needed to create the Catholic Worker Movement. This is Martin Luther King, who I'm sure you all know, uh, who stood up against Jim Crow segregation and was willing to get arrested and was willing to risk his life over and over again to insist that the country not be segregated and divided. And then this is Sandra Chavez, uh, who was a farm worker who created the first and still largest farm workers union in this country, um, insisting that farm workers' rights be respected, including their rights not to encounter dangerous, untested pests. So when we recognize that climate change and structural violence, that this country has struggled with structural violence before, we then get to learn from this cloud of witnesses of people who have resisted structural violence in the past. So I wanna briefly just learn a little bit from two of them and then we can throw up this conversation. But first is Martin Luther King, who, um, who just shut us down. What can you say about Martin Luther King? There he is, back. okay. Cool. Um, Martin Luther King, who not only famously struggled against racism and segregation, but said that racism was part of the triple evil of racism, poverty, and militarism. And the face of the Vietnam War said um, that he wanted to stand up against violence in the world, including what he said in 1967 was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world, which was his own government. Uh, and that was King recognizing structural violence and recognizing that he as a citizen had the power and the responsibility to stand up against it and demand change. And one of the things I really like about King is that he always insisted that this change, if the problem is structural, the change must be structural. So he had this great interpretation of the parable of the Samaritan. He said, look, if, um, if you read the parable of the Samaritan, you just think it's great that this guy helped his neighbor, then you're missing the point. Because we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. You see somebody laid on the side of the road, you're called as a Christian to help them. But you're also called to ask, what's going on on this road that somebody could be beaten and bloody and left by the side? And whose job is it to keep this road safe? And how do I get them to do their job? And so the change must be structural. And when we kind of talk about climate change, the change must be structural. King said, uh, well, let's get that. Um, caring for our neighbors as Christians, and I speak as Christian, if you're not a Christian here, you're very welcome. And I hope you consider other people your neighbors in whatever way that, that's meaningful to you. But caring for our neighbors in Kivalina, um, in Bangladesh, right here in the South Sound means demanding that systems change because the systems we have are not working hard enough to prevent forest fires to help people evacuate when there are forest fires, to assist the people of Bangladesh uh, to adapt to an entirely different climate than their parents' generation lived in, to help the people of Kivalina to maintain a community in a, in a place that is now not hospitable to their community. Uh, King has this in common with, um, with one of our contemporary cloud witnesses on the climate issue, who is Greta Thunberg. And Greta Thunberg also calls for systemic change. She says, if solutions within the system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system. <laughs> Greta Thunberg is, a, is an about atheist and more power to her, but I kind of wish she would talk about the pair of the Good because I think there's a really good way to make this point. But like Pope Francis, Redenberg is not yet asking for advice, and so I, I mostly give it myself. Turnberg and King's message is that we have to do something about structural violence. We have to do something about climate change, and it's not enough to think about our own personal lives. In fact, it's a distraction to think too much about our own personal lives. A fun fact is anybody ever calculated their carbon footprint? You know, like done all these online calculators. I've done it. I used to assign all my students to do it. I don't anymore. When I found out that the carbon footprint calculator, the original one was created by BP. 
And we now have like direct evidence that there were people in boardrooms who said, let us create this so that when people say, I'm worried about climate change, we can get them thinking about what they're doing rather than what we're doing, yeah. right? Yeah. What needs to change is not my personal decision. What needs to change is the laws and structures that allow BP to keep ripping oil and natural gas out of the That's the third message, that's King's message, I think, or at least as I interpret. The other person I want to talk briefly about is Dorothy Day, uh, who, as I mentioned, um, was had just converted to Catholicism when the Great Depression started, and so was on fire as only a convert can be, um, with like the spirit of Jesus and the call to love her neighbor, and saw hungry people all around her, desperate for work, desperate for food, desperate for shelter. Um, and her response to that, she had been a communist before she converted to Christianity, so she said, I'm going to start a newspaper. And I'm going to teach people the truth. And she started the Catholic Worker newspaper, which is still published today, um, and still costs a penny a copy. There's a fundraising cost a penny a copy, which we'll later. Um, and in the Catholic Worker, she made this this proclamation that I mentioned: that, like people are unhoused. We have all these churches, so Catholic churches need to throw open their doors. And she wrote about how important that would be. And she was very proud of herself for having written. And then um, people started showing up at her door and saying, I hear that there are houses of hospitality, can you give me directions? And she had to say, no, no, I'm, I'm asking the church to do that, but they haven't done it yet. <laughs> and a uh, very sad story is that one day a woman came to her door and said, I hear there are houses of hospitality, I have nowhere to go. And Dorothy Day said, I'm sorry, the church has not yet done what it should and not opened the doors. And that woman uh, went suicide that day. And Dorothy Day, the next day, rented out the apartment below hers and said, anybody needs a place to stay, you can come. And within a couple of years, I rented out an entire building in New York City. And I created the first Catholic worker house. There are now 240 Catholic worker houses across the country. There's one in Tacoma. Um, and they are all houses of hospitality in some shape or another. So Dorothy Day, unlike Martin Luther King, was really not interested in politics. She didn't think politics was really going to solve any problems. She had the zeal of a convert, and she believed what Christians are called to do is love their neighbors with their full hearts. Um, and she said, to work to increase our love for God and for our fellow human beings, and the two must go hand in hand. This is a lifetime job. We are never going to be finished. Love and ever more love is the solution to every problem that comes up. And this is where we're getting to what I promised that we have some hope. Um, I actually find this a really hopeful message, right? I don't know how to make sense of climate change. But I think she might be right. That climate change is a problem and love and evermore love is it's not the only solution, right? It's not all we do. We don't just like sit and love hard and then move on unless we're called to a really particular vocation. But um, but whatever we do. It's going to be guided by love. It's going to be guided by what we truly are willing to commit ourselves to, to care so much about, that we would be willing to rent the apartment below and throw it open. That we would be willing to devote our lives to housing people uh, who don't have a place to go. And that exact dynamic of housing people who don't have a place to go is going to be really important as the climate continues to change. Because climate change is, um, among other things, a refugee problem. So this is a photo of refugees um, from Syria uh, trying to make land in Greece in 2015. Um, the UN says over 20 million people are currently displaced, displaced by extreme weather events. And the UN High Commission on Refugees is spreading that message because they're saying this number is going to keep getting bigger. And we're going to need more resources to take care of refugees. Climate change is a problem of migration. Because some places are shrinking and some places are losing water, and people who live in those places now are going to need places to go. And that is a problem to figure out. And Dorothy Day says part of the solution to that problem is going to be love and ever more love. And I think this is super important to emphasize because we are in the midst of what I think is a disastrously bad debate about immigration in this country. Um, and uh, these are pictures of. The, the walls that are currently being built of uh, razor wire 
of razor floats and of just incredibly unwelcoming signs. Uh, a lot of the people who are at the U.S. southern border are at the U.S. southern border because it has become harder to grow food where they're from. And it's become harder to grow food where they're from because the climate is changing. There is not an easy answer to figure out what to do with the fact that a lot of people want to come to this country and we don't know how to safely process them all. I don't have the answer to immigration, but I know whatever answer we get, it's going to be better if it's motivated by compassion and by recognition that the problem is climate change, not bad people or, or people who we don't respect as people at all, which, um, which somebody recently said. And, um, and I don't see love and ever more love on this screen. So, Martin Luther King reminds me, whatever we do about climate change, we've got to change structures. And I think whatever we do about climate change, we've also got to get better at welcoming strangers. Got to get better at, um, at opening the doors. One of the reasons Dorothy Day gave when people told her that she was making a mistake by welcoming strangers, by just opening doors and letting people live with her and her young daughter. One of the things she said is, you never know um, if you read the Bible, you will find that often strangers show up, and it turns out they are angels. And I don't want to be the one who turned away God. And that's who I think is coming when somebody asks me for help. Uh, and what Dorothy was referencing there, um, among other things, was this part of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus said, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of these, the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. So Dorothy Day's insight, Dorothy Day's moral uh, prophetic message was, uh, however you're treating the people in the world in the most need, that's how you're treating Jesus Christ. That's how you're treating God. And uh, I think she said that to encourage us to be loving toward the people we encounter who are in need, people we on the Jericho Road and the people uh, monitoring Jericho Road. And I think uh, it's a message I would love to hear more of when we think about what to do about the fact that a lot of people want to come into the United States, a lot of people want to work in the United States, a lot of people want to be in the United States. Uh, how would we think about that problem if we assumed that uh, those people are God's representatives asking for our That um, call to love our neighbors as they are displaced is to me, and we can talk about whether it is to you, uh, the hope that comes out of thinking about climate change as a problem of structural violence, as a problem um, that uh, builds on poverty, builds on racism, builds on colonialism. Because it means we are not alone. Because it means we have giants whose shoulders we can stand on and think about what to do about these issues. I'm not going to give a clean and pat answer about what you should do about climate change because there's no shortage of those answers. What I've tried to build is a guide to think about whatever answers you might pursue. There are a thousand things you could do about climate change. Um, and uh, I think if they are guided by a commitment to work on broken structures and to be motivated by love, then, then they will be constructed. So um, the hope that I draw from seeing climate change as violence is the hope that John Woolman saw the violence of slavery and demanded, before there was even a country called the United States of America, demanded that we cannot found a free nation on slavery. And he failed, he died in a slaveholding colony that became a slaveholding country. And a hundred years later, slavery was abolished, in part because people like John Woolman had continued insisting slavery must be abolished. And lots of people fought, and lots of people struggled with that, but John Woolman was one. And I take hope from the fact that Jane Addams um, saw uh, immigrants being treated poorly and went to live with them in a poor neighborhood in Chicago and insisted that she could learn from them and they could learn from her. And a community could be built where it wasn't as important where they came from than it was where they lived together right now. And I draw hope from Cesar Chavez, who, um, whose 
a little pride here. Uh, as you heard, I'm a proud of Luke these days, whose last prominent speech was given in 1989 at Pacific Lutheran University. Um, and what he said then was that um, we should all learn from the sacrifice of striking farm workers because they were on strike at the moment. And, um, and what we should learn from that sacrifice is that um, when we are willing to give something up, we take away the system's power over us. And so when striking workers are willing to give up the day's wage, suddenly the employer has less power over them and they gain power over each other. And so Chavez said, uh, to make change is to figure out what you are willing to give up in order for that change to happen. And that lesson has really helped me as I think about how am I trying to fix systems? How am I trying to make political or social or cultural change? And what am I willing to give up to do that? The hope I get is that these folks all made a real difference and made the world their world less violent. The other hope I get is that none of them solved the problem, right? There's still racism in the world. There's still uh, trouble with farm workers in the world. And yet we still honor them because it's none of our job to fix it. It's our job to make it better. It's our job to love our neighbor. It's our job to make the system a little better. And so when we ask that question, what do I do about climate change? I know this because I do it all the time. What I'm secretly hoping is that somebody can tell me, what's the thing I can do so that after I've done it, I can feel like, okay, great, I don't have to worry about that, right? <laughs> and what all these people remind me is, a fulfilled life is not a life where you get to say, like, check off the problem, it's gone. A fulfilled life is a life where you say, I'm doing my part, and I'm with other people who are doing their part, and I am also trying to live a full life. And I think that's the hope that we get if we take climate change seriously as a problem. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna say, since I wrote that book, I've been thinking about a lot of other people who I think of as a part of this cloud of witnesses. And if you want to talk about them, we can. But, um, but uh, what I want to end on is, if if this is interesting to you, these are the books, um, including uh, arrogantly my own, that um, help are helping me right now to think about what can, what could, what should be done about climate change. And so. If you are interested in communicating with this issue, these are really good places um, to start. And these are the sorts of books I'm recommending to my students who are particularly worried, upset, or, or passionate about climate change. So uh, I, I will leave that up because what I think that represents is there are lots of good ideas, lots of ways to talk about climate change. I hope mine is one of them. Um, the thing about climate change and structural violence is useful. But uh, Come in at right about an hour, so I hope we still have some time, right? We can still take some time for discussion. Um, now, what I want to hear is your responses to that, which can include let's talk more about something I said, or it can include uh, something I didn't say, um, which you really think I should have, and people need to hear. Um, and I think for the benefit of the recording and the, the couple people we have on Zoom, uh, if you raise your hand, I'm going to come bring you the mic just so we can all hear. And um, you might be tempted to make a lecture again. And I respect that, because obviously I was. Um, and what I'll ask is that if the lecture is a really short lecture, so that we can, we can give her a bunch of questions. So does anybody want to start us out? Anybody want to um, give feedback, uh, give perspective? Yes, I have a shared thought. Uh, two weeks ago, we celebrated, or we celebrated or remembered last Friday. And on that day, on Friday, Jesus tore the temple from the, the temple curtain from the top to the bottom, which means that Christ was God, was never confined, and God is all over the world. So now every bit of this earth is holy ground. The air we breathe is holy. The dirt we walk on is holy. The water we drink is holy. And as everything is holy that God made it on the Friday, we must treat it as such. Uh, Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was going to tell you about this. Yeah. On the very first Earth Day, and I was alive then, and I said, they sold a t shirt and a necklace and a sterling silver and to remind us that Earth is in harmony and we should wear this every Earth Day. And if you listen to this, 
That is what earth is in harmony. So this is what we want this earth in harmony. Absolutely. And I don't know if you've ever seen one. I haven't. No, thank you so much. I'm over 53 years old. <laughs> There's my trouble. I'm not. <laughs> Oh, you better have someone else. <laughs> no, but you got it that work thing, didn't you? <laughs> um, so someone else has no last. I, I love that, and I love the, the, the harmony of the two things we said, right? That, that we should trust the earth is in harmony, we should trust there is a balance to be found. And um, those of us who are Christian or, or, um, or monotheistic or religious might well believe that harmony is part of God's plan, it's part of God's creation. Part of the, the love God has for creation realized in uh, in the Easter story. So yeah, thank you so much. I love that. Very powerful. Anybody else? Don't have to. It does occur to me that for each of those people whom you admire so greatly, there was a good deal of violence also accompanying them uh, as they moved to change the structure of this of this simple society. Mm -hmm. And we need to be prepared for that. The the evil is is real and the evil is not going to give up its control without resistance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, uh, I think a really vital point, and I think a, a point where we have to ask um, uh, the question that I think Chavez asked us, uh, raises for us, which is what what are we willing to sacrifice? And it, it doesn't need to be everything, right? Um, uh, I think people are called in different ways. Uh, one man who worked with Dorothy Day, um, his way of saying it was, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to look good on wood. Uh, because what the violent system does to people who oppose it is crucified, right? Um, uh, and Martin Luther King, of course, was was assassinated for for the work he did. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons that uh, Jane Addams is in the book is I find her so helpful in conversation with Dorothy Day because Dorothy Day was just a devout radical, and Dorothy Day never took a salary for her work with a Catholic worker and lived in poverty her whole life because she said, if you want to love the poor, you got to be with them. So she talked about like how she would she would have bed bugs. And she said, well, the other people living in the shelter have bed bugs and I will have bed bugs. Amazing, her commitment, right? And so I think we have to be willing to uh, suffer if we want to make a difference the way Dorothy did. Jane Addams, by contrast, um, lived in a neighborhood uh, of, of, immigrant, of uh, immigrants in poverty in Chicago but um, bought and fixed up a house where she was going to live there and um, had this inherited money. She came from a really wealthy family and took like month long trips every year to Europe as a break from her work with impoverished people. And, um, and you know, we could debate like which one of them was better or something, or we could just recognize these were two different ways to make change. Both made real sacrifice, both made real change. Uh, one of the photos that was up briefly that I didn't talk about are two people I've been thinking a lot about who are named Ruby Montoya and Jessica Reznicek. Um, and uh, they were um, protesters at Sandy Rock against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And when the, when the um, armed forces moved protesters out of Standing Rock, they went um, to Iowa. Uh, and protested against the aspect of the pipeline there, including like chaining themselves to where it was going to be built. And, um, and when the protesters were ultimately defeated and the pipeline started to be built, everybody else left. And Jessica Rosenstein and Ruby Montoya would not tolerate the idea that this pipeline was being built. And so um, on, on election night 2016, they um, snuck onto the construction site and lit three bulldozers on fire and caused hundreds of thousands of dollars damage, and then spent the next few months um, sabotaging construction sites for the Dakota Access Pipeline. And the best estimate is the pipeline opened like three months later than it would have without their, their sabotage. As far as we can tell, they got away with it. Uh, they were never caught. 
they um they, they learned to like use a blowtorch and they were like cutting pieces of the pipeline and they started to cut a piece and then they saw that oil was flowing through it even though the permit said no oil would be flowing and they stopped immediately and they said we're not going to mess with this thing anymore because we're not trying to get anybody killed never hurt anybody um a year after they stopped they had still apparently not been caught nobody knew what they'd been up to um they turned themselves in and they turned themselves in because they said we we want the world to know what we were willing to do and we want other people uh to step up and be willing to do this and they're both now serving terms in federal prison under terrorism charges um and so when you talk about like what what people are willing to sacrifice i think about those two and i I'm, I'm going to confess to you, I know I look really tough, but I've never committed sabotage, or I don't know how to use a bullet torch. I, I am amazed by the bravery that these women show, um, and the commitment they showed to then turn themselves in, in order that the world would know what they had done. Um, and, uh, and I think we have a lot to learn, right? We don't need to do what they did to respect their bravery and to ask, what are you willing to be brave? So thank you so much for We're talking about um, the border and um, expressing our frustration about that at um, Sunday school class on Sunday. So um, everybody's my question was, what can I do? And so it wasn't very hard to find out what we can do. Um, I went online and uh, there's a coalition of churches, among them a Lutheran church in North America, in El Paso, Texas, that has a robust um, uh, pro 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 program that only works with people who are uh, properly vetted and are on the side of the border and are there legally. But it takes a long time for those papers to be processed. And so meanwhile, um, they have to be housed and fed and you have to have water and things like that flowing for the children. And that's their um, legal way of doing something. And they're more than willing to take down lynchings. And so um, all you need to do is get out there and find out that there are ELCA churches that are deeply involved. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Right. And again, I, um, I, I hope that's consistent with what you heard me saying. There are lots of things we can do about climate change, especially when we recognize that immigration is a problem of climate change, um, that war is a problem of climate change. I'd also say, I mean, my personal, um, uh, my mother is really uh, dedicated to issues of immigration and volunteers at a, at a refugee center at a refugee school. And I think this is really important work to do, right? If we are worried our country is not as welcome as we'd like to be, we can go be people who are welcome, right? We can go be people who help others to adapt. Um, I think of my main activism um, around the immigration issue these days is that I, um, Make myself obnoxious. Uh, I live in the city of Tacoma at Tacoma City Council um, meeting. When um, other people stand up and here. complain about how Tacoma's changing, we shouldn't yeah. build any more apartments. Um, because I honestly think if I can be a voice that says, yes, we should have denser living spaces in Tacoma, that might be the best thing I could do for the world right now. Because Tacoma, um, we, we will have struggles, we will have fires, um, the South Sound will. But, but we are likely going to be a safe haven for lots of people who can't live where they're living right now. And so I think the more we can prepare our communities to be places where more people live, that are welcoming, that are open to more people coming, where God forbid our property values might go down or change, um, then I think the better we are equipped for the world that I, as far as I can tell is coming. So yeah, we can, we can absolutely support people on the border. And we can also make our communities uh, more welcoming, more open, uh, have more space. Uh, I don't want to keep everybody too long, but there's probably time for maybe one or two more. And we've got. So, one good reason for hope is that when we get together and we all feel the same way, it's not really like an echo chamber as much as it is like. It gives us better mental health and it makes us more encouraged and it makes us feel like there are wonderful things happening. And I know that there's at least something happening at the Peninsula Lutheran that I just saw a sign about. So I was going to ask somebody to talk. Just... Well, 
Well, uh, what we're doing right now is the 27th, we're having a uh, drive through recycle event where you can bring your car to recycle things uh, and leave them off, and we will take them where they can be made into something that you can reuse. Uh, and since it's Earth, you know, Earth Month, we will have an emphasis service on the 21st, I think. Uh, we're volunteering. We volunteer at the parks. Um, we have a volunteer day coming this month, and I think we're going to volunteer at the Wilkinson Farm this year. Last year, we volunteered at the Grand Rapids Park. But in terms of structural change, I'm, well, I would, I, all I would say is if, you know, we need an EPA that's effective, we can all take time to write our legislature, state, encourage the, the EPC environmental protection, well, let's do what do they call it? It just left my brain. But anyway, people say regulation is bad. I say regulation is good. We need to encourage those people that are representing us to uh, make regulation and, and and see that they're enforced so that we are um, not everybody can be as greedy maybe as they as they are. Okay. Yeah, we, we we do have we're we're a group that's only two years old, so we're kind of interested in what you can do in the church as well. And um if you have anything to drop out, you can come between nine and noon on twenty seventh. Stop there. Um so um this is really personal to me. Um my Nephew is a wildfire firefighter, and uh, he has eight trucks. And uh, he has a contract with the DNR. Um, and they nearly lost their home in Carlton. Years ago, six years ago. So. And um, and my cousin uh, almost lost. Her home and her horses in Thomas Fire in Ohio. Um, and I think there are things that we can do now um, as a community that people probably aren't aware of. Um, in that um, the Meadow Valley, which is like Eastern Washington that we never even think about, um, we can join their Facebook page and, and look at that and prepare because the fires will come and they're real and they come every year and every year they they get worse. Um, but in some way, be able to um, help them get water over there or donate food for firefighters or blankets, special um, their fire retardant um, things that that they can wrap themselves in. My grandniece lost her best friend. They were joint valedictorians in uh, the Carlton Fire. Um, you may have heard of a young man who was lost in the fire when the fire truck coming over uh, rolled over. That was my niece's best friend. And, um, and you know, these communities are real, they're small, and it's here and, and it's real. Um, and, and if you have a uh, property that can take animals or horses, there's uh, websites and communities out there that um, can say, here, if you need to get your animals out in this situation, be prepared, you can bring them to get over or wherever you want. And, and those kinds of resources, um, and I'm just speaking of my family in California and my family in Washington State have been enormously helpful to them and reassuring. Um, in the Carl, in the Thomas Fire, my cousin was going one way to get her horses out and with her partner, and the fire jumped the road and they had to all turn around the horse trailers and they went down the Pacific Coast Highway and. Um, and fortunately, there were people there that just said, here, we're taking the horses, you go, you go, be safe. So I think those are just things that we can think about as, as little people here that we don't think
about. So thank you. Yeah. But I'm going to okay. Yeah. Last word. But one of the best things we can do that I grow is plant trees. And Luther said, if I knew I was going to die tomorrow, I'd plant a tree today. We need to say that is if we don't plant a tree today, the world is going to end tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, I, I might I might say if we don't plant a tree today, we should plant one tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I, I think what um, what what I want to pull out of the theme from these last four comments is that um, it is it is really hard, and it's really hard when we know people who are suffering. Thank you for sharing that. And it's also hard in a different way. I don't mean to compare, but like it's also hard when like you've got like old electronics in your basement and like it frustrates you every time because you're like, I can't throw this thing away, but I don't know what else to do with it. So, so this is a service you're providing and I thank you. But but the, the theme that I want to bring up here is that um, none of us are alone in doing this work. And and one of the one of the main reasons to do the work is again not because we're gonna fix it, we're gonna make the world all better. Uh, there's something there's something about original sin or the fall or something that Lutherans teach us that means like we can't fix the world, um, but we can feel less alone in the world. And and the people I want to be with are the people who are planting trees and the people who are taking care of these animals and the people who are running the recycling event and the people who are calling out other churches to make sure that the light is shined on them. And um, and so, you know, with with the five people that I talked about, with with every uh, hero we may look at, nobody does this alone. And often, the reason people keep doing the work is because they find community in it. And so, um, what do we do about climate change? Well, one thing I think is we, we find other people who feel the same way we do, and we do what they're doing. Um, and it is really hard to be hopeless when you're with other people and uh, you find that you have company. And and um, and so that gives me a really great way to thank you for being here tonight for creating this community. Um, to thank those who planned this and those who invited me here and those who allowed us to change this date and to be right here near Earth Day. Um, and uh, and keep the green team going here next day and so many other great churches because these communities are uh, the thing that gives me more hope than anything else. So thank you for being part of this community. Thank you for being here tonight and thank you so much for the conversation. Well, I want to please extend our thanks and our gratitude for sharing this evening. I, I'm sure that we all feel we've learned something, and I think also a very interesting perspective that um, maybe wasn't a, but we weren't aware of, of working together and finding hope and making a, a bit of a difference not having to uh, solve the whole problem. So um, are there any other announcements that we need to make? Okay, well, thank you all for coming. It was a wonderful thing to have this evening. <laughs> well, I do have one more announcement. I knew there was something else I wanted to say. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> we, did, we did record this, and starting next Monday, it will be on the On This Day website. I know there's a number of people that had 